So suppose we have an extension field E over some base field F. Uh, so we say that E is an extension by radicals over F if there exists a chain of subfields that looks like um, F0 sits inside prop sits properly inside of F1, which sits properly inside of F2, which sits properly inside of F3, all the way up to Fn. So we have this chain of fields for which the very bottom one, F0, um, it has nothing to do with Captain Falcon. I mean, it's it's just going to be the base field F right there. And then Fn is going to be the extension field E in consideration. So we have all these subfields for which the intermediate subfields each have the form Fi is just an extension of Fi minus 1 where we've joined some element alpha i. Okay, and alpha i has the property that there exists some positive integer mi that when alpha i is raised to the mi power, it actually belongs to the subfield fi minus one. So I want you to think about that for a moment. If we take like, for example, the cube root of two, um, which clearly belongs to the field um, q adjoined the cube root of two, um, which is a field which properly extends the rational numbers. Notice if I take this number, so Q would join the cube root of two, it is an extension of, of Q by, a, it's a simple extension, we just adjoin this element alpha i, but the element alpha i has the property that if you cube it, you get back two, um, which is a rational number. So this is what we mean by a radical element. Uh, so alpha i is a radical, you know, the square root, it's a root, square root, cube root, fourth root, whatever, nth root of some element of, of fi minus one. So in this situation, uh, such an extension, we say that E is an extension of f by radicals. And so this is a recursive process. We do allow things for like the square root of one plus the square root of one plus the cube root of two. This would also be such an element uh, because if this is if this is our element here, basically what we do is we take our field q, we extend it by adjoining the cube root of two. Then we extend that by adjoining the square root of one plus the cube root of two. And then we extend that by taking Q adjoin the square root of one plus the square root of one plus the cube root of two, something like that, right? Um, and so this is uh, this has exactly the form that we're looking for. We have this chain of fields. Each, each element or each extension is a simple extension by a radical. And what do we mean by radical? Is that if you take some power of this element, it'll give you something back in the base field, right? So the cube root of two cubed gives you a rational number. Um, if you take the square root of one plus the cube root of two squared, that gives you a number in this field. And likewise, if you take this number, the square root of one plus the square root of one plus the cube root of two, if you square that, that gives you a number back in this smaller field. So this is an example of an extension by radicals. And so you can get these complicated radical-like expressions. Um, we say that a polynomial f of x inside of the, the base polynomial ring f of join x, we say that the polynomial f of x is solvable by radicals if its splitting field E is a radical extension of f. All right, so that's what it means for a polynomially solvable with radicals. So the quadratic formula is evidence that, well, for a ring of characteristic zero, honestly, it works for any every field as long as you're not characteristic two. Uh, but the quadratic formula, let's just, let's just focus on rational numbers here, the fields of characteristic zero. The quadratic formula tells us that every quadratic polynomial is solvable by radicals, that up to a, a radical extension, we have to add the square root of something to our field, and that then gives you a splitting field for that polynomial. Now, there are analogs of the quadratic formula for degree three and degree four polynomials, that is cubic polynomials and quartic polynomials. Um, and while we haven't talked about them in this lecture series, uh, maybe maybe it, maybe I'll post some optional video about them sometime. Um, it, they're, they're kind of cool, but the, but they can get kind of tedious and very difficult to use, um, practically speaking. But be aware that the existence of the cubic polynomial does tell us that all cubic polynomials, the existence of the cubic formula, which it involves square roots, it involves cube roots. So as long as you have a field whose characteristic is not two or three, the cubic uh, the cubic formula applies and all cubic polynomials will be solvable by radicals. Similar things can be said for the quartic polynomial, that as long as you're a field whose characteristic is not two or three, 
Um, in particular, if you look at fields of characteristic zero, the quartic formula tells us that all degree four polynomials are solvable by radicals. Some combination of like fourth roots, cube roots, square roots can produce the solution to any quartic or cubic or quadratic polynomials. Clearly linear polynomials are already, uh, they already split since they're linear. Um, and the, the quadratic formula has been known since like time immemorial, right? We, we've known about this for the longest time, basically. Um, at least primitive notions of the quadratic formula existed, even if not the modern sense. But people have been able to solve quadratic equations for a long, long time. The discovery of the cubic poly, of the cubic formula was actually a pretty big deal because it was the first moment where the mathematical community as a whole started to take imaginary numbers seriously. I mean, there was this bigoted term. We call them imaginary numbers and real numbers as opposed that real numbers are more important or more real than the imaginary numbers. Um, I would beg I would beg to the argument that negative one half is just as imaginary as the square root of negative one, uh, but I digress in that situation. Um, the, the concept of imaginary numbers was very much um, you know, very much mired in controversy and scandal there, right? It was the discovery of the cubic, the cubic formula, which use which utilizes imaginary numbers, it utilizes complex third roots of unity uh, to solve polynomial cubic polynomial equations. Even if all three solutions are real numbers, you can use imaginary numbers to solve cubic polynomials. And so that's really what got the mathematical uh, community's attention with, with regard to imaginary numbers was that, you know, even if imaginary numbers are fake, they're useful. Hmm, interesting. And then shortly after the discovery of the of the cubic equation, because there was hundreds of years between um, this, you know, the formal discovery of the quadratic and the cubic. It was a big, a big difference there. But shortly after the discovery of the cubic, the quartic followed very quickly behind it. Uh, it was a pretty easy discovery from one to the other. The breakthrough, that is the Im imagined numbers with the cubic really led to the quartic. But then as people try to extend the quartic to the quintic degree five polynomials, they couldn't do it. They, they couldn't find, again, we got stuck for hundreds of years here, trying to find a general quintic formula. And it turns out they couldn't find it because it can't be done. Um, the general quintic polynomial is not solvable by radicals. And let's explain why that is. Um, it all depends upon this theorem right here. And so we're going to prove this in the case we, which we have a field of characteristic zero. So basically like Q, uh, F is the rational field, Q. Um, for other characteristics, you have to do something a little bit differently. I'm not going to worry about that in this video right here. But suppose we have a polynomial um, from a polynomial ring um, where F is a field of characteristic zero. Then that polynomial F is solvable by radicals if and only if the Galois group of the polynomial is a solvable group. Fantastic result that these two notions are in fact equal to each other. They're, they're logically equivalent. The solvability of a polynomial has to do with the quote unquote solvability of the Galois group, which is why we call them solvable groups, by the way, um, because they are the, exactly the Galois groups that allow us to solve by radicals. Um, this is an if and only if statement. Uh, let's prove the first direction. Suppose that F is solvable by radicals. Um, therefore, there exists, well, if you, if you take its splitting field E, that means E is a radical extension of F. And so therefore, there exists a series of fields, F0, F1, F2, all the way up to Fn, where Fn coincides with E and F0 coincides with F, where each of these subfields, each of these intermediate fields is a radical, you adjoin a single radical element. So Fi is just Fi minus one, adjoin some element alpha i, where alpha i has the property that for some positive integer mi, alpha i to the mi belongs to the base field. So it's a radical of something from Fi minus one. Okay, um, what we're then going to do is we're going to consider some new fields. We're going to take the field EI, which is just FI adjoined by all of the roots of unity contained inside of E. Okay, uh, for which we want to include roots of unity if they weren't already there. So it's very possible that this extension does nothing, but uh, we can throw on roots of unity and be aware that throwing in roots of unity is not such a big deal because roots of unity themselves are radical elements. If you have a root of unity, say zeta n, be aware that zeta n to the nth power is equal to one, which belongs to the rational field, which means it belongs to every field of characteristic zero. So if you ever have a field E, I, which is equal to fi adjoined zeta 
n, be aware that this is also an extension by radicals. So throwing in the roots of unity uh, doesn't really complicate our solvability by radicals whatsoever, but it can guarantee that these are Galois extensions. So the issue is that when you have this radical, you, you have these this radical extension, these fields might not be Galois extensions, even though they're radical extensions. Now, the good news is if you throw in roots of unity, that'll guarantee that each of these extensions, EI over FI is a Galois extension. Well, why is that? Because if you take this field extension right here, um, FI, and you look at this element, um, alpha I, by construction, alpha I, well, we already have F in play here. Take take the polynomial GI right here. If you take this polynomial X to the MI power minus alpha I to the MI, this is a polynomial inside of F I minus one, a join X, uh, because alpha I to the MI power is an element of F I minus one right there. And so if you take GI, this polynomial and evaluate it alpha I, this then gives you zero. So it's a root of that polynomial. But the other roots of that polynomial are gonna look like alpha I times zeta to the K, right? These are also roots of that same polynomial um, where in this case, you get that zeta is equal to some, you know, it's equal to some mi th root of unity looks like myth right there i hope that's not a word that causes people issues there the mi th root of unity uh so this that then makes this extension right here ei to fi that's going to make it a galois extension and so that's why we throw in these roots of unity roots of unity are radical extensions but so by including a few extra radicals we guarantee that we have galois extensions where we need there to be galois extensions so let's now look what we have right here now consider consider the um the field extensions f is contained inside of e0 which would be F adjoined all of the um, roots of unity that are contained inside of E, okay? Then you have E1, E2. So at this point, what we did here is we threw in all the roots of unity that we needed um, from F to form E0. And then from E0 to E1, we throw in alpha one. Then to get to E2, we throw in alpha two. Then we throw in alpha three all the way up to alpha N, right? So basically we're essentially just adding one new field to our extension here, which is just roots of unity, a cyclic tonic extension, which is a radical extension. And so in particular, all of these uh, extensions are now gonna be Galois extensions. So we now have constructed, because we had a radical extension, we were able to grow that basically by adding one new field. Essentially, that's all we did. Now, all of these fields are different than our original fields, but if you think of the elements we have to add from uh, we have to add 2f to form e we basically have only added one new field and that includes roots of unity which if you do if you add one root of unity at a time those are radical extensions all right and now they're all galois extensions radical extensions can always be turned into galois extensions and because they're galois extensions we can then utilize the fundamental theorem of galois theory uh, for which when we look at this right here as these are each each galois extensions uh this this um, this is a normal extension of fields, right? Um, E1 contains, this is a normal extension of, of E0. E2 is a normal extension of E1. E3 is a normal extension of E2. And each of these is a proper containment, right? Um, they always, I guess that should be a proper containment right there. It's always getting bigger, never stays the same. And so when you look at the, goal, the Galois correspondence, this is gonna flip the inequalities backwards Okay, all of these inequalities are going to be backwards now. Um, and so then you have F, E0, E1, E2, etc. Um, be aware that in this situation, I don't necessarily guarantee that it's proper because it could be that F already contains all the roots of unity um, that E contained, but what have you, right? So that one maybe doesn't grow. Uh, this one, this one definitely will grow. But then when you take the Galois groups, this chain is going to flip around. Um, and because each of these were Galois extensions, this is going to become a subnormal series, right? Because E1 is, uh, that is, since E2 is a normal extension of E1, that means the Galois group of E over E2 is normal inside of the Galois group of E over E1. So this chain of normal field extensions turns into a subnormal series of groups, okay? And likewise, the next thing I want you to note here is that because these are Galois groups, 
that's, that's the, because these are Galois extensions, we have the very important property that the quotient, the Galois group of E over E minus one, mod out by the Galois group of E over EI, um, that'll be isomorphic to the Galois group of EI over EI minus one. That was the big part of the, I mean, that's one of the important aspects of the fundamental theorem, that these quotients will coincide with Galois groups themselves. Um, now, when you look at this, when you look at this series right here, um, this, this subnormal series, I want you to notice that the factors of the subnormal series are always going to be cyclic. It's always going to be cyclic. And why is that? Well, because these group, because these fields E contain all of the roots of unity, if you adjoin one um, of the radical elements, because you already have all the roots of unity, that's going to guarantee that this Galois group is actually, in fact, cyclic. Because um, this, this group will have order M, MI, that's going to be order, um, and you, you have you have an element of mi order in that. You're going to have this mi cycle if you think of it as a permutation group. Um, so that generates the whole group, and it's going to be cyclic. So we've what we've done is we've constructed, looking at the Galois group here, we've constructed a subnormal series for which all of the factors of the subnormal series are going to be cyclic. All right. Now, this is important because this series, if it's not a composition series, it can be refined. It can be extended to a composition series because a composition series is just a maximal subnormal series. OK. And as you refine the subnormal series into a composition series, these these factors will also uh, become smaller in that process. They're going to be quotients of this thing. But the quotient of a cyclic group is always a cyclic group. So as you refine this subnormal series into a composition series, since all of the original subnormal factors are cyclic, this tells us that the composition series is going to be having cyclic factors as well. That tells us that our Galois group is, in fact, solvable um, as as is now just discussed right here. Um, and so this, this is giving us that the Galois group of our polynomial is in fact a solvable group. It's pretty impressive how we did that. Now, this is an if and only if statement. Um, I'm not gonna prove the other direction in this video right here. Um, it's a lot harder going the other way around. That is supposing that the Galois group is solvable um, and then proving that the polynomial is solvable by radicals. That's a harder direction and I'm gonna admit it because honestly, we don't need it for what we're trying to show because the direction we have is sufficient for our purposes because what we have here is that if the polynomial is solvable by radicals then the Galois group is solvable that means the contrapositive is also true if the Galois group is not solvable then the polynomial is not solvable by radicals so voila consider the following polynomial f of x equals 4x to the fifth minus 10x squared plus 5. This is a polynomial that we have considered already in our lecture series. And in our lecture series, we proved with this example that the Galois group of this polynomial is S5. And as we've already proven, S5 is not a solvable group because its composition series would be S5, which contains A5, which contains one, hence your composition factors are Z2 and A5. A5 is a simple group, but it is not cyclic. So um, a, S5 is not a solvable group. Hence, by the contrapositive of the previous theorem, we get that this polynomial, which is degree five polynomial, cannot be solved by radicals. Um, no combination of radicals, no fourth powers, fifth powers, third powers, third roots, that is, um, you know, no fifth roots, fourth roots, third roots, square roots, no combination of them will ever solve this polynomial. That doesn't mean we can't solve the polynomial, it's just we can't use radicals alone to do it. It's kind of like when we talked about geometry before um, in this lecture series, that um, if you talk about constructible numbers, those are the numbers which we can construct using a compass and a straight edge. Uh, and we can't solve every geometric problem. We can't trisect an angle. We can't double the cube. We can't square the circle. Um, you know, those are some of the problems that we can't solve with, with a compass and straight edge. That doesn't mean we can't trisect angles. We just need better tools than that. Um, you know, if you have a protractor, voila, you can trisect an angle, of course. You just can't do it with a compass and a straight edge alone. Um, if you have a ruler, a ruler and a, and a compass, I'm fairly certain that you can you can trisect an angle with those tools. So you just need better tools to solve those problems. The same thing also applies to this theory of equations. While radicals by themselves is an insufficient tool to solve 
uh, this polynomial equation. It just means one needs better tools. And these tools have been developed. Um, it's just this kind of takes us beyond what we wanted to talk about in this abstract algebra lecture series. We wanted to, because this example right here is a motivating example. I mean, Galois himself essentially developed the modern notion of a group in order to solve this problem, all right? And this is why we named Galois theory after um, Everest Galois, because of this fundamental idea that the solving of equations comes down to this problem with groups. And it's a beautiful marriage between field theory and group theory and represents really the climax of this lecture series. So even though the problem is now proven insolvable, unsolvable by radicals, that doesn't mean the problem's unsolvable, um, but it does show you the power of abstract algebra in this situation that what didn't seem like it had anything to do with each other, groups having to do with this, yes, groups do have something to say about not just the solvability of equations, but groups have a lot to say about basically everything. Group theory can find its way into basically every discipline, not just mathematics, but science as well. And so I hope we can take this example as the power of groups, that groups are awesome and they can do everything, or at least they can show us that we can't. They're, you know, At least I like how groups, in this case, we've seen examples where groups show us we can't do things, uh, but I don't want us to end with that pessimistic note. Yeah, um, it's the groups are here being used to show the limitation of the theory of radicals, uh, but groups are very, very powerful tool of mathematics. And so I hope you've enjoyed learning about groups in this lecture series because they're very, very powerful tools. And in my opinion, one of the coolest things about mathematics.